I wanted to maybe ask a controversial question initially to get things going, which is, is there too much money chasing too few assets? Who would like to go first? <laughs> Mike? I'm very, very happy to step in on that. I, I, well, I, I think you're absolutely right to focus on the amount of money that's come into the sector um, in the last uh, couple of years, um, and particularly for uh, Ricardo and myself being in the in the listed uh, sector, and obviously focus on that. So we've seen um, in in the 12 months from uh, the listing of, uh, of BSIF and UK Wind, uh, the first two renewable funds to come onto the listed market, uh, there were uh, six uh, listings of renewable focus funds. Um, and a total of uh, just over a billion sterling raised. Since then, uh, we've seen those funds uh, grow through subsequent listings, uh, sub subsequent uh, issuance of shares to, to over 2 billion uh, now in the market, of which uh, just over 800 million is focused specifically uh, dedicated to the solar sector between Bluefield, Foresight and Next uh, as the three listed players. So you're right, there has been a significant inflow of capital to the sector. I think the interesting thing about what's happening in the sector in terms of uh, investment funds at the moment is that there has been a switch in the in the types of investors. And I think the reason we, and I suspect uh, Ricardo, uh, doesn't feel uh, threatened by the, uh, the the influx of capital to the sector is because I believe that um, there will there will be a shift in the in the nature of investment in the sector. I believe that the uh, the listed funds have. Um, a very significant advantage because of their moving cost of capital as the market evolves. And I think that's critical. And we can talk sort of further about the, the cost of capital in the sector, I'm sure, will come up. Um, but I think that's the key. So the, the, there is a lot of capital, um, and the winners in the current market are those who have the cost of capital to, uh, to work in a, uh, a market which is changing, evolving, uh, presenting new opportunities, uh, uh, but also uh, challenging us in terms of the, the volume of uh, what we saw historically as the, as the very easy wins of, of large scale, uh, quick to transact projects. Thanks, Mike. And, and Pietro, in terms of coming at it from a slightly different perspective, as more of an intermediary. Yeah, I think, agree? I, I think you know, that was mainly focused on the equity side of things, but I think on the, the debt side, you know, there's been a lot of debt infrastructure funds that have entered the market really to kind of support you know, the, the sponsors of, of these assets really in kind of financing the purchase or the refinancing and the construction of such assets. So, yeah, I mean, we're very bullish. I mean, I think it's great if you're an owner of assets, then, you know, you've got cheaper finance basically coming in, which is, which is a good thing. Okay. Well, actually, that is a very kind of neat segue, though, into cost of capital, because um, I guess if we put the question open to developers in the room, uh, maybe they'd be some, we might agree that there's a lot of capital around, but not at the right price. Do I see nodding heads, shaking heads? <laughs> no one is. No one's prepared to, to show their cards. But but actually, let's talk a bit about cost of capital because it's uh, as important as availability. Uh, I think it's also important to mention that uh, although yes, there's, there's a significant amount of equity available in the market at the moment, it also depends to look at which stage of investment they're prepared to to deploy the, the capital. So, for example, from a developer perspective, it could be that some of this capital is not available mm -hmm. if you're trying to to fund development or even construction. So it's important to, to separate the, the, the capital available at uh, at construction phase, but also at uh, operational stage. And that's where we're probably seeing an additional increase of, of sort of the funds that we haven't seen in the last couple of years. I think that's also a good point, though, in terms of actually, I've sort of said you've got a lot of money up here, but, but uh, do you have a preference for installed versus pre-construction? Uh, well, from a foresight perspective, it depends on the funds that we're talking about. So currently, our flagship fund is the the, the listed vehicle, the Yieldco, that we have in the UK. However, historically, foresight has been also managing tax efficient funds, uh, VCT EIS products. Uh, so, depending on on the nature of the fund, depending on on the on the risk profile for those investments, we might have a preference to to acquire operational assets rather than uh, rather than uh, assets shovel ready or doing construction. Uh, and that is also linked to your, your previous point about, about cost of capital. So it's important to try to separate the cost of capital depending on the stage of the acquisition. Um, however, the markets are, are changing. I think uh, most of the investors are becoming more and more comfortable with different risk profile of the transactions. I mean, clearly there is a, a complete understanding now how, for example, the rock accreditation process runs. It is a better understanding uh, on how uh, the funding of a construction, uh, the funding of the milestones for an EPC contract has to, to be run. Clearly, the main challenge we have is usually regulatory restrictions, mainly 
the end of a rock period. So that always causes a little bit of a concern from, from equity providers, mainly if you're talking about uh, uh, investment products that are targeting, we can argue, conservative return levels uh, or more infrastructure type of returns. So from that perspective, uh, the recent, for example, changes in the rock uh, regime could cause a little bit of an issue uh, for, for, for funds that are trying to have a very stable or, uh, or de-risk uh, or de-risking their position when it comes to funding construction. So that is also one of the main, main restrictions. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we are seeing a, a change in the market. I think most of the equity providers now, especially the long term and the, the ones providing the lower cost of capital, are becoming more and more comfortable with uh, the risk associated to each stage of, uh, of a solid development. Okay, so maybe um, unless anybody else wanted to add anything to that point. The only thing I would say on that is I think the, the previous talk, not to kind of venture back into it, but it, it had elements which are kind of relevant, um, talked about you know at what stage you know different forms of capital can come in, so equity can come in at the development stage, etc. You know I think while bank debt prefers kind of you know low leverage construction funding uh, or nice operational assets, mm. I think the institutional um, investment market, you know, the, the debt funds again, they're far more comfortable now taking construction risk than they were two years ago, a year ago even. And I think the reason for that is the banks have come back in and they kind of now need to compete, not just on price, which they always have, but also in terms of the ability to offer more flexible funding right. solutions. So, it, you know, it, it kind of pairs off quite well. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I think just just one point to make is is that um, a, nobody is is ever happy about the cost of capital. It's always too high. Um, uh, but generally, there's been a lot of liquidity uh, put in the system. And um, um, a few days ago, we were talking to our economists who were saying, essentially, you look at you look at the, the situation at macro level. There's more than a hundred billion of excess cash in the system in Europe, and that cash attracts negative yield. So it means it's it's pushing down yield across the, across the risk spectrum. And uh, I think what we're seeing is uh, is margins are, cost, are, are falling down uh, across the, um, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire risk spectrum. Ultimately, when it comes to the specific of solar, I think operational, you'll see a, a lot of pressure and more and more people piling in, uh, both equity and debt. Um, when it starts becoming more difficult is construction because of the, the rock, well, the, the deadline and, and the cliff risk that was uh, highlighted at the last session. And I think on development, it's the, it's the regulatory uncertainty. But I think at the end of the day, there will be pockets of capital available for each stage and um, uh, they will be priced, you know, the way, the way they're priced. And that's, that's according to supply and demand. So I guess we're kind of agreeing there is a lot of capital out there, but it's you know it's, it does depend on what stage your project's at and also the specifics as ever. Um, but uh, one thing that sort of struck me is you know the, the the title of this session being investment opportunities in a mature market. Uh, we could question whether or not we are actually in a mature market, um, and I did wonder whether the panel had any comments on that. You know, particularly as we've got changing subsidy regimes all over the place, and we still need a subsidy. Anybody want to pick up on that one? Go on, I think I think we're heading in the right direction of becoming uh, a mature market. Uh, I'm not sure if we're quite yet uh, there yet. And let me add, if you don't think it's a mature market, what do you think would what needs to change to make it mature? For example, one of the, one of the points that uh, I think we need to start seeing as well in order to be able to qualify this sector as a mature market is also uh, the start of the secondary market. I think you need to be able to demonstrate as well to the investors that you have uh, a route to exit investments if that's the decision of the specific uh, product or, or, or fund. And also is a way of validating the type of discount rates being used uh, in secondary market transactions. So I think the market, the solar market has been growing exponential the last few years. Uh, I'm sure uh, under the responsibility of many of you in this room. Uh, we managed now to deploy probably around what, seven gigawatts of solar, including residential or commercial rooftop and ground mounted. However, this has been mainly on the back of either uh, full equity products, mainly initially with the VCT and the IS funds supporting the, the, the equity, the, the solar market. Then we had the yield cause as well uh, starting to to, to invest in the sector. More recently, we have pension fund insurance companies and a combination of private equity, hedge funds type of investments. I think the next step is then as well to demonstrate that we actually can transact this type of, of, of products 
or, or assets uh, in the secondary market. As well, we've seen most of the acquisitions now being made uh, on a full equity basis. Only now we're starting to see more involvement from the debt providers, either traditional banks or other type of, 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 of debt products directly involved in the acquisitions or the structuring of these acquisitions. Uh, if you look, for example, at the BFI sector, which I think we can consider to be a quite mature sector, uh, I think you won't see any single deal being done on equity basis. Everything is done on a gear basis, considerably high level of gearing, which is also uh, an aspect related to the type of subsidy you have for those type of products. However, solar, in that sense, is only now giving, I would say, its first steps towards the more mature market characteristics, which is not to see secondary market transactions, but also uh, having to involve a uh, cheaper cost of capital rather than just full equity in order to make, uh, uh, I would say, the optimization of the capital structure. So for, for those reasons, I think uh, I think we made a lot of progress the last couple of years, uh, clearly having to, to adjust to a new subsidy every 12 or 18 months has been challenging for most of the, of the, of the fund managers and, and equity and debt providers. Uh, hopefully we'll have a period of stability uh, now that we're within the, the CFD uh, process. Uh, however, I think to reach the, a mature market, we're still probably a few, a few steps away in order to demonstrate, mainly in terms of liquidity of the secondary market, but also in order of demonstrating that we can actually structure uh, in a more optimized way when it comes to the capital structure of the, of the projects. Okay, so, so still a little bit of a way in terms of the way that capital is deployed in the sector, but, but actually doesn't that require uh, a more stable regulatory background? Mike? Looking like you were up for that one. Yeah, throwing, throwing on me, it's a slight, a slight curveball. Um, I, I think we're, you know, we have to accept we're operating in a regulated market. Um, and you know we we are all as a as a group here benefiting from uh, regulation that's been put in place to support and create a sector, and I think it's uh, it's naive for uh, for us to believe that we should be in a sector where um, we aren't subject to uh, the regulator needing to make changes uh, year on year. We're in an incredibly dynamic sector. We're in a fast growth sector. We've talked about the huge amounts of capital. Uh, and the changes in cost of capital uh, in that sector. Uh, and that's happened uh, coinciding with uh, massive changes in the cost uh, of development and construction. Uh, so I, I personally, um, you know, I think we have to work. If we choose to work in a regulated market, we have to work uh, uh, and be ready for regulatory changes. Uh, I think there's always reason to, uh, to complain about the regulator and to, to argue that they could have things, uh, done things differently. Uh, be more consultative, etc. And I'm not going to uh, uh, sort of argue one way or the other on that. But I think we are where we are, and that we, uh, you know, going going back to this point of of being a mature market. I think um, the challenge for us and the the need for us as investors in the sector is to be able to uh, take account, uh, learn quickly uh, those regulatory changes, and then to adapt to them and bring the right sources of capital. Uh, to uh, to accommodate those regulatory changes, and I guess what what I'm coming to there is that I've got a very significant amount of optimism about the future for solar um, in the UK, uh, notwithstanding the regulatory change, because I think there is still, if you look at uh, any of the other scaled markets in in Europe, there is still a, a massive capacity uh, to be built out, uh, both on the ground and and on roof, and I. I believe as a, as a group here that we have the capability to do that. And I think as you know, was touched on in the previous session, there may be uh, short periods where everybody is working out how to address the, the change in regulation and, uh, and to move forward. Uh, but I think, you know, the, as we've said, the volume of capital going into the sector and the volume of, of people employed in the sector means that we, we have the capability and the capacity and the financing to find a way through that. Um, and fundamentally what's been set out for us in both the existing regulation and the new rounds of regulation is the potential for long-term certainty. And for, for our investors uh, and for the way we look at investment, uh, the, the biggest concern is always retroactive change. And I think um, for us, we've always been able to hold the line very strongly in the UK, which is not the case in many of the other markets that we might look at, that the risk of retroactive change in the UK is very low. And I think that's the, the fundamentals of what we need 
in, a, in terms of a stability of environment to invest in. I think we can manage changes in the regime, changes in the uh, remuneration, uh, if we've got certainty that once we lock something in, uh, that we can then live with that for the next 20 plus years. Okay, great. Um, any other comments on that? I would just say, I mean, I, I, I think we'll see, weirdly enough, I think when we get to a mature market, we might not see that much secondary assets. You know, in the PFI markets, we don't really see that many assets changing hands, yeah. although they are on a leverage basis, as Ricardo says. You know, the, the real drivers when you see um, secondary assets change hands in mature markets are kind of the cost of that capital is actually a lot cheaper. So, you know, you can buy it at X and you can refinance it at Y or whatever the case may be. The market we've got right now, while it's immature and there's still mispricing, there's a lot of free equity and, you know, money in the system, it's actually a good time. You know, and that's why the secondary market has started to pop up. That and the fact that we've got, you know, mature EIS funds with tax-driven, you know, um, vehicles kind of coming out and being, you know, purchased in some form or another. So, really enough, I think actually when we get to a mature and very stable environment, we might actually see less secondary market activity than what we see now. Um, but I think we'll, it'll grow for the next couple of years anyway, because there's still a big runoff of, you know, the existing subsidy and the new kind of regimes coming in. So, well, I guess that's a good point, but also in terms of where we are at the moment and with the latest CFD auctions, not to get you know, distracted by that, but I'm assuming that we'll, we'll have a bit of a pause in some ways in uh, construction of bigger sites, which, um, not to steal the thunder from the next panel, but, but it is, you know, if, if commercial, uh, sorry, if ground mount isn't such a, a big opportunity right now in a primary market sense, um, and the last panel talked about the challenges around rooftop, it would be good to ask this group, you know, how much are you looking at rooftop? Are you finding ways to overcome the challenges? What's the uh, what's the opportunity? Olivier, do you want to pick up there? I think I think rooftop is uh, uh, is 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 a big one. Is a big one to come. That's that's where the politicians want the money to go. I think from a from a banking standpoint. Um, the first the first transaction we ever done was actually some commercial rooftop in in Germany, so it, it is doable and provided it is structured properly. I think it comes um, it comes with a with a number of challenges, and uh, ultimately, um, you know, capital will come into the sector because there's a lot of competition for uh, um, for uh, for opportunities. Uh, it's, it's it's down to. Um, Finding the right uh, the right formula uh, to make to make it work. So is there ap appetite? Definitely, uh, is, is 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 down to uh, to shaping it properly. But I think I'd like to to come back to the um, uh, to 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 the to the grand to the grand mounted uh, sector. I think last year, if we if we had been talking uh, back in May when uh, when the government uh, announced the uh, the changes to uh, to the rocks. I think I would, uh, I, at the time, we were cert certainly thinking, well, the price of the assets will go down on uh, in terms of uh, development rights. There's not going to be a lot of uh, a lot of project being realised. Certainly, from a banking standpoint, we were sharing Sue's view uh, regarding uh, uh, the cliff edge risk. And guess what? You look at how many megawatts uh, that have been developed between say spring last year and now and um it's it's a, it's a gigantic amount so i wouldn't i wouldn't rule out uh, rule out um the ability of the industry to continue doing a lot of a lot of grand mounted although clearly uh, from a regulatory standpoint and a, and a political standpoint uh, people want the money to go into uh, uh into the, the commercial sector i mean i'm a i'm a big fan of this stuff <laughs> surprise surprise um, I think I think the key really for if you, if if kind of sponsors are looking at rooftop is the standardisation yeah. uh, of of everything from the contracts through to you know the the, the leases or licences whatever route we go down. Uh, but I think yeah that's that's really the key the standardisation because if you don't have a standardised process and and set of documents then the due diligence costs alone are going to really eat up you know uh, the, the the kind of returns that can be on offer. <laughs> So I don't think anyone's going to disagree with you on that, but you know, I know there are a number of initiatives in respect, in respect of housing associations with Macquarie and Light Sources' recent announcement and BPVA mm -hmm. looking to, um, to introduce a lot of solar to schools through their Powering Knowledge programme. But we talk about standardisation, it's sort of easy up here as a group of people saying we'll just give them one contract, but that isn't how it works in the real world. 
what can the money do to actually facilitate that? I, slightly subverting your question, but I, I mean, we've, we've invested in, um, in a number of commercial industrial projects. In fact, that, that was what we mainly focused on uh, previous to the, the listed fund in 2013. Um, and I, I think one, we, can, we can definitely all work towards structuring sort of standardised documents, standardised approach, etc. I think the challenge you have in rooftop is every rooftop has a, a landlord and a tenant attached to it. And the, the reality of our experience investing in those projects is every person or personality needs looking after. And that particularly applies where you have uh, a, a need to collect revenues from them. So if you're, you know, the, the, the old residential model of free solar worked very well because you didn't really need to interact with, with your counterpart. You stuck it on the roof and then, and then you got your cash from the government and you don't really need to touch them again unless something goes wrong. The, the problem or the challenge I see beside the initial transaction uh, on, on commercial rooftop is you need to collect from these guys and that means they're expecting something from you. Um, and our experience is there's a whole world of potential for misunderstanding and mis-expectations in terms of what a solar project will deliver, uh, which you could never imagine when you enter into a project uh, that the customer will have as, as their expectation. And I think that's a, you know, there's the initial transaction, but I think that that's the real challenge we have, that until we can get to a point uh, where we can offer free solar, uh, if we can ever get to that point uh, for commercial industrial customers, I think you know the challenge you have in terms of scalability is is dealing with your counterparts because you need the, the volume of people you need to be able to deal with individual counterparts and, and manage that relationship on an ongoing basis in order to make the collections in order to to cover off their needs, their changing organisation uh, and their changing requirements is, is incredibly challenging. And I, I think that will continue. It makes it a sector which is difficult, therefore, to consolidate um, and difficult to economise on. Although that's kind of very much in terms of the CNI sector, whereas actually schools, housing associations, you have got much longer term tenants. So I guess there is a good opportunity still in I that think space. I mean, even, even in the social housing sector uh, where things should have been fairly standardised, I mean, we've seen the you know, good things and, and certainly very bad things. So, um, you know, I'm always, I think, I think standardisation is, is going to be um, a, a big one. And the, the, only, the only way to, uh, to move away from that is start seeing portfolio of scale where you can, t you can start as a... Uh, I guess as a debt provider, you can start taking a, a, portf a true portfolio um, a view of life. So that's a challenge, I think, to Mark to come up with a set of standard documents for every potential landlord and tenant. <laughs> we'll see you sometime next century. <laughs> uh, it's, so more, it's more down to people who are inclined to negotiate. So you talk to any landlord, they all have, um, they all have their own sets of, of expectations and want to uh, cut a deal in, in one way or another way. Well, maybe that's a, a, a good moment to, um, to see whether we have any questions or comments on the floor on anything that we've talked about. <laughs> Otherwise, we can keep talking to each other up here. No <laughs> one over there. And yes, please say your name and organisation. Uh, Guy Beasley, Seoul Century. Uh, how open is the money to minority equity investments coming forward? We know that the the government's pushing for community ownerships and, and different sorts of arrangements as opposed to all equity and hold to term. What do you think the, uh, will that increase asset management costs? Will that, are you guys open to it or is it a, a non-starter? Non good question. I think it's a challenging one. We, we have been looking at different structures, uh, mainly co-investment. Uh, and, and apologies if I cannot really look you in the other part of this question. Uh, uh, the main challenge, I think, at the moment is to try to find the balance between the co-investment structure. I mean, historically, uh, equity providers, especially the type of funds that, that we manage, either leases vehicles or, or uh, tax-efficient funds, we do require to have control uh, over, over the assets and control over the decision-making process, especially at the operational level. This was critical for uh, EIS and VCD funds, mainly because of the plan exit requirements of those funds. Uh, also, in terms of uh, leased vehicles, uh, we do expect to be able to dictate as well uh, how to operate those assets. Uh, 
Having said that, we think community funding is definitely a structure that needs to be uh, analyzed. Clearly, there's political incentive in trying to implement those structures, so it's, it's not something you can ignore. It's just trying to uh, find the right balance between having a co-investor that is willing to rely on the expertise that the different funds and asset managers have been gathering the last four or five years of this industry. Uh, and that's where we find uh, the structure to be, um, well, still has a, a little bit of work to be done. Uh, however, uh, especially considering that it could allow us to deploy um, higher amounts of equity, especially because we can consider bigger projects instead of the, the cap at five megawatts, is definitely something that we're, we're very interested in looking at. Uh, but the key will be down to what sort of involvement does the co-investor, which we would expect to be more of a, of a silent investor more than anything else, on the back of, again, of the expertise that probably uh, the current fund managers will have or the equity providers will have compared to community funding uh, entities. Uh, so we're, we're trying to be able to, to, to pass the that, that that knowledge that we gather during, during the years in a way that works for both parties. Uh, so that, uh, that, in my opinion, will be the main challenge. However, I mean, it's a very valid route to ensure that we have other pots of equity available to continue to grow the market. Well, again, let me kind of pick up on um, your question actually and expand it a bit because, you know, for those of you in the room who know who Abundance is, you know, we are raising debt from the general public to put into projects. Um, and it was always conceived to be, say, not always, originally conceived to sit between equity and bank debt uh, because we viewed that as being the only way actually to get in. Uh, so far, we've been the main source of capital other than equity. Um, but with shared ownership, which will be picked up tomorrow, and Carl, my co-director, is going to be talking about that. Uh, one of the things that we're struggling with, which I put to all of you here, um, is if we do put the public in, and it's co-investing, and we do a lot of due diligence for the projects, not on behalf of our customers, but so that we can create the offer document for them. But if we fast forward to a situation where something was going wrong, how are we going to deal with a situation where the general public is left high and dry whilst the senior funding, uh, and for some of you those doing equity it won't be relevant, but you may be looking to put debt funding in, how do we avoid that scenario? And, and I think you know, the finance community may need to consider moving. Um, one of the points that uh, we always make is if you put lots of individuals into this sector really going to help in terms of secure its future going forward. So I'm very interested personally to know what your views are and then I'll cobble Sue later and, and Daniel from HSH Nordbank. But, but yeah, go on, Mike. I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's an old, old problem with an old solution. It's, you know, it, you're talking about classic mezzanine investment effectively and I, I don't think it makes a difference who the investors are, the fact that it's community rather than... Well, uh, I'm saying, why can't we come alongside, why can't the public come alongside on the same terms I, I think the, 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 most the, pro the problem for the... Well, it can <laughs> that, that's, that's yeah. a question for the banks. I, yeah, I think yeah. the answer is probably probably no. Um, uh, but I, I think there's, there's a... You know, the, the standard way of dealing with, with the problem is to sit... Uh, underneath the senior piece, but if you're above the equity, then you're, you know, the equity is always going to protect itself, right? Um, and you know, if 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 things go, you know, the, the equity is running the project um, <laughs> until things have gone very badly wrong, at which case it's it's gone to the it's gone to the bank. Um, but you know, for so long as the equity owns the project, the the equity motive is always going to be pr to protect. Uh, the bank's position and the mezzanine position because they rank ahead of him. And so I, I, I don't see, I mean, maybe, maybe you could sort of uh, further, further where the challenges are, but, you know, the, the, the fact of needing to have some sort of control as a, a community investor, um, I don't see as, as a, a necessary concern to invest because it's very normal for um, you know, minority uh, investors stroke lenders to come in behind equity sponsors to take uh, a mezzanine type position where they are protected and they have their preferred return uh, but they cede control to the person who's taking the, the leftover cash after they've taken theirs out and I think that's a it's a perfectly adequate way of, of protecting um, the, the mezzanine. The, you know, the, the challenge on mezzanine is always the, the relationship uh, with the bank in the event that things go very bad 
um, because obviously the bank's motive at that case in that scenario when the when the when the control switches to the bank uh, the the bank's motive is is obviously protecting itself and that's you know you build that into the intercreditor with the mezzanine but I, I think it's a bit of a I you know no no offense I I think is a challenge which is least present in solar versus any other type of mezzanine that that, that you see um, because solar is so stable and we all know that the reality of of operational solar projects is the 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 prospect of seeing um, your equity disappear and your bank taking over the keys is uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure there's been any cases in the UK that I'm aware of um, and in the absence of, of retroactive regulatory change which of course has happened in Europe and even there there's been very few examples of banks taking over the keys so I, I think as it's I, I wouldn't see it particularly as a threat um, and as I say, I think getting a preferred return where you're sitting above the equity gives you a very aligned structure to allow the equity, as, as Ricardo was saying, to sit there and, and get on and control and optimise the asset. Okay. Well, I, I wouldn't disagree about the comment on solar for sure, um, but I think it does depend who your equity owner, majority share, or your controller of the project is. But anyway, just to, to keep go back to the floor to see, are there any other questions from people? There's a gentleman there in the middle of the room. Yeah, do. Um, government gives little role or no role to local authorities. Uh, uh, gives little or no role to local authorities other than the potential for promoting and supporting um, community investment and, and community initiatives. Um, if they were given more of a role and some greater incentive, could they possibly be um, encouraged to offer some form, some degree of guarantee to community investment, which eases the um, the, the the role of the, the, the investor, the, the debt finance. In some ways, I think I'd almost put the question back to you: Can government be persuaded <laughs> to give local authorities more of a role and the ability to offer guarantees? I don't know. The, what's your view on that? Your own view. I, I, I <laughs> I, I, th I think it really depends upon the people in the industry, the people sitting on the top tables, to say, is the, there is a role. There is a role. Um, you know, we are the agents of community. Um, and at the moment, we're not being empowered um, to give uh, an adequately, I'll put it that way. So I think it's the view of other people in, who are in that position. Well, I think there's, there's definitely, from our own perspective, a big opportunity to work with local authorities who are also large landlords uh, and long-term landlords, you know, going back to the point around standardisation. So um, uh, if there were a way to get local authorities to actually work in tandem to deliver best practices and a standard set of documents and approach... I think there'd be a lot of people in this room that would welcome that. We certainly would. We, we, we would welcome the opportunity to help fund that. Um, and I'm assuming the same would be true here. So what I, you know, that's a bit of a holy grail, though. I don't know how you achieve that. It's a bit like Olivier's comment around housing associations and everybody wanting to do things slightly differently. But does anybody have any specific comments to the question? I think, I, well, or to the maybe more the overture. Well, yeah, I think there's a number of ways local authorities could participate. You know, they can they can work in different ways. They could be the the off taker for you know the, the PPA, for example. That would be very interesting. Um, they could participate potentially in the equity, um, or they could you know offer some kind of guarantee if if it's, that's not ultra virus for them um, on the debt. And if they did that, then you know the institutional investors would be clamouring all over it because you know, the sort of authority you know, well, it's a very it, cheap uh, form of yeah authority. well certainly you know what we see is local authorities can borrow cheaply um, and that's a way to you know help projects get rolled out and let the community come alongside or indeed any other funders but also I think uh, you, you mentioned um, if if a project goes wrong I mean in solar touch wood you know the, the sector has been has been really good but you've got you've got the the reputational risk and, and the fact that you know if uh, if more money is required to fix a temporary glitch, um, you're dealing with a community with uh, a lot of people that may be an issue. If you've got a if you've got um, a, a county council involved, then for sure that would that would help and that would uh, help in uh, 
in solving potential uh, potential problem. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, we've done some community community based financing in the past. But the, the the question that is always raised is, you know, what happens uh, from a reputational issue uh, standpoint if if um, you know if um, something goes wrong with a project? Thanks, Olivier. Other questions? Yes, gentleman here in the middle, and then one at the back too. It's probably all we have time for, but let's get those two. I'm going to be quite slightly controversial here and Will ask you say your name and, name and Colin name? Hammond N7. Um, I believe that the solar market has become mature by stealth. Um, in my own position, I've seen large investors now wanting to invest in development because it's a cheaper risk to take the development failure than it is to pay high project rights prices, NTP prices, uh, have construction margins taken out. So actually some long-term holders are investing in development. And so you don't see it today, but in six months time, you will see there's not the big cost of transaction comments. I don't know, I think that's, uh, I think that could be the possibility. I mean, historically, we only had a handful, or even less than that, number of players that can actually take a project from development to the actual long-term ownership. Uh, so we have seen a fragmented market in that, in that sense. Uh, what we've seen is a, a high number of developers, uh, a less the number of, of VPC contractors, even less the number of, of asset owners that can take the ownership in, in the long run. Clearly the introduction of, um, of uh, more established long-term debt providers, like pension fund insurance corporations, will change uh, the market slightly. However, uh, I'm not sh so sure if, if those type of investors are willing to take development or construction risk in, in this industry or any other industry uh, associated to renewables. You could have a few uh, equity providers, mainly some hedge funds or even some private equity houses that might be willing to take that role and to, and to back developers from the very early stage. Uh, but I think we'll still continue to see a limited number of, of equity providers that are actually able to take over or take responsibility of the funding of the entire process and still uh, uh, remain uh, uh, present as the long-term owner. Even in the ones that are doing that at the moment, usually it's with the view of building a, a portfolio of assets to then be able to sell into the secondary market after probably a year or two once the assets are operational. Uh, but what we're seeing is that there's a, an attempt to try to, to, in a way, from an equity perspective, try to, to eliminate the fat around the process. Uh, and the, sometimes the best way to do that is try to limit the number of counterparties involved in the process. So if you can have a developer who's also uh, an EPC contractor, for example, that will uh, allow to, to well, I mean, first of all, uh, to have a more straightforward process when it comes to negotiating uh, the acquisitions, but also trying to minimize the cost of, of, of building a solar park. And this will become more and more relevant, for example, once we enter, well, we already entered, but uh, with a full start. Uh, into the CFDs, so the less number of people you have involved in a, in building a CFD project, probably the higher the chance you have to uh, to be able to, to submit a competitive tender into the, into a CFD auction. Again, uh, there are a lot of moving parts on the in this type of approach, um, but I suspect we'll still see a, quite a fragmented market in the next upcoming months, even uh, one or two years, between the development side of the market and the long-term equity providers. For the ownership of the assets. Thank you, Carla. Just the, John at the back, one last question between us and lunch, John. So I hope you haven't got a really long, complicated one. Just wait. So thanks, John, org management. Um, we've heard quite a bit about how institutional investors are starting to enter the market, but it's pretty clear they, they've entered the market now. Could we perhaps share a little bit about what their appetite is and what they're trying to achieve in the, uh, in the solar ground mount market? long-term income? Um, well, like, can <laughs> I jump in first? Absolutely. I'm sure we'll say the same thing. <laughs> um, what, what are they trying to achieve? Um, you know, the, the, the attraction of solar to, uh, to our investors is low correlation uh, and yielding returns. So the, the simple objective uh, for, I think, all of the listed investors is to deliver long-term stable yields that aren't correlated to, uh, to the markets. 
Um, and for that reason, solar is very attractive. What do our investors want having, having achieved that or having uh, sort of persuaded them that that's what we can deliver? They just want scale. Um, so investors want uh, foresight, they want Bluefield, they want uh, the other players in the market to, to grow in order to become uh, liquid players, to give them the liquidity to, to come in and out of the stocks uh, when they choose. Um, and they want us to deliver exactly what we said we do, which is, uh, is stable, low risk yield uh, over the long term. Um, so I think the, you know, the challenge in all of that, or the one challenge in all of that is, is scale and, and continuing to grow. And I think that goes back to some of the topics we've discussed, which is uh, the need for some consolidation in the market and also the need for us to uh, sweat our brains on, on how to uh, continue to invest in a changing regulatory environment. Thanks. And just because you've got a different audience, yeah, I was about to say, very I think, quickly. I think it's really you know what the the debt side of that that equation really wants is long dated assets to match up against their long dated liabilities, and ideally inflation. And the only place they can really get that in the UK um, is renewables. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. I, myself, I can't quite work out whether this is a champagne moment for solar or a cold tea one. So I'd like to ask the room: those think it's a champagne moment, a cold tea moment. Nobody's got a view. <laughs> okay, on that on that bombshell. <laughs> thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to everybody here.